Hello, this is Brian Auten of Apologetics 315. Today's interview is with Bobby Conway. Bobby is the lead pastor of Life Fellowship in Charlotte, North Carolina. He is also the founder of The One Minute Apologist, a creative YouTube ministry designed to give quick answers to curious questions. He is also author of the book, Hell, Rob Bell, and What Happens When People Die. The purpose of this interview is to learn a bit more about Bobby and his ministry, explore the use of multimedia and apologetics, look at apologetics in the church, and get his advice for those studying apologetics. Well, thanks for joining me for this interview, Bobby. Well, it's great to be with you, Brian. Thank you for having me on today. Well, I appreciate you being with me today, and would you mind telling our listeners a bit about the sort of ministry you're in today? You bet. I'm actually, uh, first and foremost, I serve as the lead pastor of Life Fellowship Church. It's a, a church that I started about eight years ago in the Charlotte area. I'm also involved in doing some marriage conferences with Family Life Today. My wife and I speak on the National Week and the Remember Speakers team. But the reason I'm on with you today is for a ministry I do called the One Minute Apologist, which is a video ministry that I put together a few years back that we're real excited about. Uh, yeah, well, people can find that at OneMinuteApologist.com, or if they go on YouTube, just YouTube slash OneMinuteApologist. There's a huge channel there with tons of videos, and they're all like short and sweet little answers to apologetics questions, and given by some of the biggest names in, you know, apologetics. You've got Gary Habermas, William Lane Craig, Frank Turek, uh, a whole list of different uh, guys. So it's an excellent ministry, a great way to share and introduce people to apologetics. So what got you interested in apologetics? If we could rewind a bit um, to, you know, you've, you've, you're a pastor, but you're also doing uh, apologetics ministry and incorporating that. So what got you interested in that area? This is a really uh, simple answer to your question. It was actually evangelism. Uh, I grew up in California. I never heard the gospel until I was 19 years old. I was playing college baseball, and a buddy of mine took me to hear an evangelist by the name of Greg Laurie. And I would go week after week, and eventually I placed my faith in Christ. And I started to want to know how to share the gospel. And once I kind of got my Christian walk in order, and God freed me from some of these party burdens in my past, I headed off to Bible College in Arkansas. And when I was there, I, I just started going out and sharing the gospel with people. Literally, Brian, I was sharing in personal evangelism with 50 to 100 people a week. Uh, no one taught me how to do evangelism. My burden just took me and taught me. And what was happening is I was out in the campuses, people would ask me questions. And I didn't know how to answer the questions they were asking. And so in a lot of ways, it's how the Holy Spirit began to disciple me. As people would ask me questions, and I would go and learn uh, how to respond to those questions that they had asked. And, and it, in many ways, uh, it was just simply my love for people, my desire to see people come to Christ. That's how I got into apologetics. I wasn't looking for answers. I, I wasn't looking for information. I simply wanted people to know Jesus, and I found that this was a great tool for removing certain obstacles that people had in their life that were prohibiting them from being able to really see their desperate need for Jesus. Mm, well, that's good. That is actually one of the things that got me into apologetics as well, as I was uh, uh, you know, doing street evangelism, and the questions just started to come, you know. So uh, sometimes I wonder, uh, you know, people who don't see the need for apologetics, sometimes I think, Are, have you tried evangelizing lately? You know, you, you do need apologetics. Um, now, yeah. I like how you said that uh, it's a tool for removing obstacles. How do you see the overlap uh, with apologetics and, and evangelism um, and how they work together? Yeah, I I think that... As we go off and we share the gospel, um, we're going to bump into people that are at different places. And so there's different starting points when it comes to evangelism. So if I'm trying to share the gospel with somebody, and then all of a sudden I decide to start getting arguments for the existence of God with somebody who's a theist but not a Christian, I'm wasting my time. 
And so I think where apologetics can be a nice tool and nicely outfit the Christian with a great way to detect where somebody's at is by having a good grasp of apologetics, you can begin to figure out where the starting place is and what the obstacles are that people have. And so if somebody's an atheist, then starting at the Bible is not really where uh, someone might start. They might start with some existence uh, arguments for the existence of God, and they might move their way to the Bible. If somebody who's a theist, then you might want to talk to them about special revelation, and then you can start talking to them about the reliabilities of Scripture. And so I think that our apologetic approach, if it's um, beefed up well, it can really help us to know how to cut the fat, so to speak, out of our conversations to really zero in on what it is that we really need to help them with. And then ultimately, uh, even though I do apologetics and evangelism, we believe that the Holy Spirit has to take our words and bring them to bear on the person's heart and life, because without the Holy Spirit, our apologetics is certainly not going to save anybody. Hmm. Well, those are good insights. Now, I would like to know your insights as a pastor as well. And so, as a pastor, what's been your experience with the need uh, for apologetics in the church. You, you know, you mentioned how uh, unbelievers or skeptics, people you're evangelizing, we need to remove obstacles. But then there are believers, but they need it mm. too. So how does that work with you as a pastor? Yeah, and this is so important. I, I've been playing with this uh, phrase, doubting toward faith, doubting toward faith. And what I mean by that is I think we're living in a time where doubt is more prevalent than ever before in America. When I think that John the Baptist, who baptized Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, well, basically when he was on death row, if he could doubt, and he was the cousin of Jesus, if he could doubt, how much more are we susceptible to doubts 2,000 years removed from that time, let alone being in a culture with over 40,000 denominations worldwide, and being in a culture that's in America uh, filled with pluralism, uh, it's got a melting pot of beliefs with relativism, uh, new atheism, we've got our work cut out for us in the local church. And it's not only for helping people that are non-believers to, to deal with their doubts, but we've got believers that are just confused. The church has confused them, uh, pastors have confused them, uh, Books have confused them, and you've got these competing religions, complete, competing ideas, and so it's so important that we clean up our thinking and, and, and know how to talk well. And so my experience is the lack of Bible teaching in the church today is essentially creating the perfect storm for the greatest harvest field of apostasy ever to take place. So many of these churches that are starting today that, that, that aren't teaching theology, scriptures, and it's about relationships and telling stories, and I'm all for telling stories, and I'm all for relationships. But if we do not give substance to our people, and if we don't help them to understand the competing worldviews that are out there, what we could be doing in starting a church is basically setting up a huge harvest field for people like new atheists and others just to prey on. Hmm, well, that's it's is, scary. It's a sobering thought, and you know, it, it just calls to mind the just the importance of guarding our, the flock against false mm. teaching, uh, aberrant theology, and just the usefulness of critical thinking and. You know, removing the things that cause doubt and, and, you know, make people want to doubt their faith or start, oh, well, maybe I'll just delve into the reading, you know, reading a, uh, atheist literature, you know. Um, now, I am curious about the practical application and what sort of things you might do to incorporate apologetics into teaching, preaching, or ministry. You know, you've heard, you know, there are apologetic sermons or there might be uh, classes that, uh, you know, certain churches offer Sunday school things. What, what things have worked for you and what strategies do you see that might be useful? Yeah, um, let me tackle that. And let me just to close off, I mentioned the phrase doubting toward faith, Brian, and I think it's important if any of our listeners are wondering what I meant by that. Mm -hmm. I like the way Oz Guinness talks about doubt, and he talks about it being in two minds. Nobody can just live in a permanent state of doubt. And so I've been just playing with this idea that we're going to either doubt toward unbelief, or we can doubt toward faith. And we all have doubts at one time or another, emotional doubts, intellectual doubts, spiritual doubts, but 
in the church, we need to help people to doubt towards faith. And in the church, it's not often a safe culture to doubt. Sadly, people can struggle with all kinds of emotional issues, but then if somebody struggles with doubt, we just make them feel like the biggest sinners in the world. And I think people need a, a place where they can doubt, but as pastors and as leaders want to help them to doubt toward faith. And so mm-hmm. apologetics, and answer your question, it's important in the church. And some of the ways that we've tried to incorporate it into the fabric of our ethos and our pathos and everything that we're about and the DNA of our church is I first, I teach through books of the Bible. That's kind of my style. I go back and forth between Old Testament and New Testament. And one of the reasons I do that is I believe it's easy for pastors just to stay on their hobbies and avoid those hard passages, and it forces me to deal with some of the more difficult passages. So I've been in Genesis for over a year now. And by being in Genesis, as problem passages arrive, uh, passages that we struggle with or we might not know how to resolve, I try to bring out those tensions. And so I try to do apologetic preaching. So that's one way. Uh, use uh, the opportunities when you come to passages in Scripture that are being critiqued. Don't gloss over those. Really bring those out and let people know this, this is under attack today. And here's how I want to help you. And I'll tell the church sometimes, you might forget these things. But when you're off in college or in your classes, you've got to remember that there are answers to these things. Um, Some other things that we do is we brought in guest speakers. I've had Frank Turek and uh, Mike Lacona and Norman Geiser and others speak in the church. From time to time, I do uh, Sunday night seminars. Uh, I've done one on hell. Uh, I did one called The Homosexual Question, Is It a Sin or Not? Um, We had one done on Islam. And so we'll have for these seminars on Sunday nights. I think we're going to be doing one on, on politics coming up called The Issues We Face, and just helping people to think about how do you can get, what would the Bible have to say about going into the voting booth? And so I really feel like it's our role in the ministry to equip people to think Christianly. Last year, we actually did an apologetics conference for our church. Um, and in the one-minute apologist ministry that I do is actually a ministry of our church. It's a local church ministry that we're doing. And then we teach the youth as well. I think it's got to start with the youth, Brian, in particular. Uh, like if parents come to our church, when their kids enter into seventh grade, we could put a piece of paper in their hand that explains their whole growth trajectory from seventh grade until they graduate from high school, where they'll learn about the role of being a man or a woman, where they'll learn about worldview, apologetics, systematic theology, Bible, uh, spiritual disciplines. And so those would just be a whole host of things that we've found to, uh, that we've done to try to be effective in doing that. Well, that's a great array of things, a lot of great ideas. And I'm thinking that you know perhaps some pastors are listening and maybe they're seeing the need for apologetics, but it's there's nothing in their church right now. What would be maybe some advice you'd want to give them to just ease into it or to to get into it and you know. Say a pastor's coming to you and asking for some insights, where, why would you want to point them? Well, I think, first of all, um, b- before a pastor thinks about getting apologetics in a church, first and foremost, to make sure that, that he's sharing the gospel and the church is sharing the gospel. You said a statement that I really resonate with uh, at the beginning, and it's this idea that if we're not sharing the gospel, Uh, then we're not going to realize how important apologetics is. I mean, when somebody says apologetics isn't important, what they've just revealed to us is they haven't been sharing the gospel. And so if we get out there and we share the gospel, that's going to create the burden for apologetics. So that would be the first thing. Secondly, is I would encourage a pastor just to make sure that they're an apologetic preacher, that that they dig into the Word. People are starving for truth right now. And I think many pastors can hide behind their doubts by avoiding teaching certain passages of the Bible. And I think they need to come face to face with one passage at a time and explore that with their uh, church family. Um, I think that being a student of apologetics is critical. Um, Many many pastors, unfortunately, they quit learning after seminary. And this is a tragedy, Brian. I really feel like uh, we need to continue to be students. We need to be thoughtful uh, I think that we should be as scholarly as we possibly can in the pulpit. I think that that's huge. Uh, some other things I'd say is if there's a conference nearby, go to that. Uh, perhaps even getting your small groups engaged or your Sunday school engaged, maybe going through a book. 
Tim Keller's Reason for God is a is a is a nice place to start. It's very very readable. Um, I would say they're more than welcome to use our one-minute apologist clips uh, in their sermons. They're short. Pastors are doing that now. Professors are doing that. And then I think the last thing I'd just say, Brian, is I'd want to I'd want to say how important it is to be cautious, uh, to make sure that as they lead their church into the world of apologetics, to have an to have a humble apologetic, as James Sire talks about. I think we need more. Uh, broken apologists uh, who aren't afraid to say, I don't know. And it can be overwhelming. We can start reading all this information, and there could be this subtle temptation toward arrogance. And I think I love the statement of the late uh, Scottish evangelist, Gypsy Smith, who said, there are five Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and yourself. And most people will never read the first four. And I think our life is an apologetic, and I'm working on a book right now called The Fifth Gospel, uh, Your Life is an Apologetic, because I really feel like uh, that, that we, we can't go and learn all this information and then lose sight of how important it is that, that we really flesh out showing what it looks like to, to love each other. And Jesus says, you know, the world will know you, you are my disciples by your love for one another. And so there's this apologetic of love that was such a passion of Francis Schaeffer's that we need to recapture in our culture today. Wow, a lot of, a lot more good insights there as well. Thank you, Bobby. Now, I want to talk a bit about multimedia and the internet and such. You've got this great YouTube ministry, um, the One Minute Apologist. And uh, as you mentioned, a lot of people use that. A lot of our listeners have probably come across it. Um, what's your goal behind it? How do you see people being able to use it? You, you, saw, you mentioned how some pastors are incorporating the clips into their, their sermons occasionally. Um, and how do you get all these great guests? Are you stealing them from conferences? <laughs> yeah, you know what's funny? is the last thing I ever would have thought I'd be doing was interviews. I, uh, You know, I'm used to speaking as a pastor and uh, conferences that I might be doing. And what happened was, is about three years ago, we uh, had the opportunity to take our set for the One Minute Apologist and show up at the conference, the National Apologetics Conference in Charlotte. And the vision for the One Minute Apologist, literally it came, I was standing in my kitchen one night, and I thought, wouldn't it be great to put together some creative short YouTube uh, videos, not because uh, we're not passionate about depth, we are, but just things to get people to go towards depth. And so we thought, let's just put some little videos together. And so it was really the desire for me to do all these. And then I started getting these interview opportunities at the apologetics conference. And I got to come back for the last couple of years and do that. And then when, when I bring speakers into the church, that's when I do it as well. And so fortunately we are in the apologetics Mecca, so to speak of the world here in Charlotte. And it's provided those opportunities for me. But this year my goal is to do a hundred new videos and I don't know that I'm going to be able to do as many interviews as I'd like. I hope to, as it's sure fun uh, getting the privilege to interact with some of these great scholars. Well, uh, I like what you said there about pointing people towards depth. Uh, you know, you're not mm -hmm. wanting to give people just pat answers to big questions of faith and life. But, uh, but I also do think that, you know, it is important as apologists, you know, some of these things can help us maybe hone or refine our own concise replies when someone asks us a question because, you know, I don't know about other people, but I rarely have 30 minutes to unpack an issue for somebody when they raise this quick objection. So um, can you talk a bit about, you know, this idea of always being ready and maybe how these videos can help people? Yeah, and I do want to share because I know that it can have maybe the wrong connotation, the one-minute apologist. We are not trying to say that apologetics uh, needs to be reduced to a minute. Uh, you know, the goal of the One Minute Apologist program is we recognize we're living in a culture where uh, people like things done well, and so creativity. And when I look at the apologetics world, I think sometimes we need to be more relational and more creative, and we can be more succinct. And so that's what we try to provide at the One Minute Apologist. The interviews it has a relational component. It's creative and it's succinct. But at the end of each episode, we offer up books 
uh, on many of the episodes where they can go for further reading. And so when you think about apologetics, um, or I think about apologetics, I think it's important for us to think in terms of, of tiers. There's just different tiers. And, and so what we're doing, uh, we're just trying to give kind of commercials to give people passionate about apologetics. But then uh, what different ministries are doing, they're, they have a different approach. So there's these different tiers to try to get people to go deeper in their apologetics. But ultimately, I think as we learn apologetics, we all have to realize that if somebody needs our time and we got 30 minutes, great. Or if we got an hour, great. But what do we do when we only have a short amount of time? Like sometimes when I'm doing uh, radio interviews and they have people calling in and asking me questions on the radio, I can't just take 30 minutes and take the time to answer the question the way I want because the commercials are coming no matter how burdened I feel about my answer. And so it's important to know how to figure out what you want to say in a pithy, succinct way that will just point them to deeper truth. Yeah, that's good. Well, speaking of the depth and academic work, uh, Bobby, you've done some academic work leading up to your ministry, of course, and working in their areas of theology and apologetics, you know, perhaps some of our listeners, they're exploring and they're kicking, kicking around the idea of maybe getting a master's or some sort of degree in apologetics, and they're wanting information, they're wanting guidance from somebody who's been down that road ahead of them. So would you be willing to give some advice for those who are looking to study apologetics in that way? Yeah, and I think that's so important that we never quit learning, that we're always learning, we're always growing. In fact, right now I'm in uh, application processes with applying uh, to work on another doctorate. I want to do a Ph.D., uh, in the UK, and I'm looking at different programs to kind of go into a specialized field. And I think that we should never stop learning. We always want to keep stretching ourselves. Um, some of the things I would say is, first of all, just make sure your motive is right uh, to somebody when they want to go about doing apologetics. I think that it's not about just getting information to beat people up with our arguments. And so I think, I think when we do apologetic work, we should have an evangelistic piece connected to it. That we should really want to be able to help uh, figure out a way to use our apologetics to further the gospel and to reach people. Um, you know, I've met a, many apologists uh, who know a lot, but I'm not always starving for what they have. And so, again, back to making sure that their heart is staying solid with God while they're learning. I would say um, to somebody as well, figure out how they want to go about studying. Do they want to do it online or do they want to move somewhere? Do they want to do it part-time or do they want to do it full-time? And some good programs that are out there right now that offer masters in apologetics, uh, Southern Evangelical Seminary in Charlotte has an online and an on-campus program. Biola uh, as well has uh, an apologetics program. Denver Seminary, I think, newly released one in apologetics and ethics, and uh, Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics, uh, associated with Ravi Zacharias, where people can actually get the opportunity to get a two-year master's degree in apologetics from Oxford and be able to study with Alistair McGrath and um, just all these great scholars uh, that are in the world, um, as well as John Linick. Let's be just a few of the things that I would say that people should be thinking about, asking if the timing's right, you know, some of those things. Yeah, those are good uh, good insights. Now, you mentioned reading, uh, Bobby, and I know you're a big reader, and isn't that, you know, a huge key, whether or not someone has a degree, being a Christian and being apologetics-minded really does require someone to, to be immersed in books. So you mentioned just a bit there about the importance of you know, being sort of a lifelong learner, but would you expand on that a bit and talk about maybe some personal disciplines that you think are required if someone's you know, pushing in that direction? This is huge. I, I, really, I really see apologetics as our discipline way of loving the world with our mind so that we are prepared to give an answer. And for those that feel called into that ministry of apologetics, uh, it's going to be really important to spend some time 
studying and learning. Uh, it's kind of like the person who says, you know, I feel called to teach. And one of the things I'll ask people, if you feel called to teach, well, do you, do you have a love for studying? Because if you don't have a love for studying, you're not going to have anything to teach about. And it's the same way in apologetic work. If we're wanting to engage in apologetics, we have to take time to study. And so some of the just practical tips that I would say is I'd say, first of all, just make sure, you know, that you carve out certain blocks of time in your schedule. And everybody's schedule is different. As a pastor, I'm fortunate because I can spend a lot of time in study. And so, you know, but I've even been stretching myself more to try to get to the office by 6.30. And then I I don't do any meetings in the morning unless it's an elders meeting on Friday. And so I'll study until 12.30. And then I use my afternoons for relationship time, for administration, for meetings. And so I think as people carve out certain blocks of time, they need to carve out the time where their energy is best as possible for study. Um, I think even having friends who they can share their learnings with is critical. Uh, just getting friends that they can bounce their ideas off, having friends that they can share their stuff with is good. Um, I think reading intentionally, Brian, is really important as well. And I think uh, we can become so uh, sporadic in the way that we read and we don't really have a disciplined approach. And I think part of being a disciplined reader means we have an intentional way about doing it. And so I would encourage people, first of all, just to read the major introductions out there. Read introductions on uh, apologetics or an introduction to philosophy or introduction to world religion or cults. And then kind of go into the specialized aspect of things. I know for me, I did my uh, my bachelor's degree, I got a Bible degree, and then I did my master's in theology, and then I got uh, a doctorate of ministry in apologetics. And I really like that flow, because I think for our, our listeners, if they are passionate about apologetics, I think starting with the Bible, you know, building out your theology, and then really digging into the apologetics and philosophy. I also think, Brian, as people get engaged in this aspect, that they don't get overwhelmed. I mean, apologetics is such a rabbit hole, and we need to realize we can't know it all. Uh, every book I read reveals 10 more that I want to read, and I, I almost can get overwhelmed. And then I go to websites like Apologetics 315, <laughs> and I see all that you post in one day, and I think, how in the world, you know, and I, oh, that's great, Brian, I want to jump in and read that and read that. And I think Apologetics 315 is a great tool, because it allows people to kind of have a broad knowledge, you provide great reviews, but eventually we want to specialize in some passion areas. Um, you know, when I was in seminary, Brian, Professor Hendricks, we called him Prof, he had a great principle, and he called it his 40-20 principle. And he said, we should read for 40 minutes and then reflect for 20. And apologetics, just the nature of the information, it takes some reflection time. And so I think that whole idea of read and reflect, read and reflect, will help the apologist because you can just read for an hour or read for 30 minutes, however much time you have. Take about half of that time or a third of that time that you set aside to reflect and take notes and write things down. And that will allow stuff to go from the head to the heart and really integrate the learner. Um, and the last thing I'd say to anybody who kind of just jumps into apologetics reading, I think, is to make sure that they balance their head reading with heart reading. Um, I know for me, there's been seasons where I get so obsessed learning apologetics that I start reading, but then I'll, I'll find that my heart's shrinking for God. And I think what's important is to make sure that we have a good devotional life uh, in place where we're reading some devotional literature, where we're spending time in God's scriptures, asking the Holy Spirit to apply things to our life, singing music to God, just worshiping Him, because that's the stuff that's going to keep us humble. That's the stuff that's going to give us the integrity to say, I don't know when we're asked questions, and that's the stuff that's going to help us to not become detached apologists who are just big in our minds and small in heart. Wow, tons of great stuff there, Bobby, and I appreciate all of that. And you, you mentioned books there. Uh, speaking of books, I want to point mm -hmm. our, our listeners to one you've authored, and that's titled Hell, Rob Bell, and What Happens to People When They Die. So I 
ask you what it's about, but the title is pretty self-explanatory. So, but what's your goal here, and and what, why do you think this is uh, an important topic? Well, you know, I'm not trying to beat up on Rob Bell. I mean, he seems like a nice guy. He's really creative. At the same token, we're called to keep people on track theologically, and my concern is more with his subjective hermeneutic. Uh, Ball, uh, Rob Bell concedes the point that he's not a theologian, and that's a problem. In fact, I think it's a problem, Brian, that pastors comfortably say that kind of thing. I know what they mean. They're saying they're not a scholar. But at the end of the day, every pastor has got to be a theologian. I mean, your pulpit role is teaching people about who God is. And it's our, it's, 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 it's imperative to us as pastors that we're teaching the truth. And so in Bell's book, he he comes so close to universalism. In fact, I don't call him a universalist. I think he has a couple places in his book, Love Wins, that protects him from that. So uh, if people end up reading uh, uh, what I call it in the chapter called The Name For It, I, I describe him as a post-mortem, nuanced, purgatorial inclusivist. I know that's a mouthful. But at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, there's a lot there. But at the end of the day, Bell... In my opinion, Brian, when people buy into that and they start thinking about that, well, you know what, everyone's pretty much going to be absorbed into heaven. What it does, I think, is it really just kills our evangelistic fervor. I think that it ends up just really weakening the evangelistic mission of the church. I think it also misleads people because there's people that are non-believers think, you know what, I'll wait till my post-mortem opportunity to place my faith in Jesus. And I think the Bible is really clear. It's appointed for man once to die, and then the judgment. So I wrote this book because I care about people not being deceived. In fact, I think the most unloving thing we can do as Christians is not tell the world about hell in a broken, honest way. I think that we've got to share both sides of the gospel, that there's grace, but there's a God uh, who will deal with our sins if we don't look to Jesus Christ. And I think that's just being honest with the scriptures. And so even non-believers, even non-believers can look at the scriptures and tell there's a hell. In fact, new atheists will use things like hell. I mean, they're, they're, they're more clear on that doctrine than Rob Bell is. And so that becomes a problem. I think that we just have to be honest with it. And we just have such a desire to placate to our culture, to make things more digestible. And we have to share the truth and love and trust God with the results. All right. Well, that's good. And, and I know that uh, that's been an issue that's come up with the, the uh, Rob Bell's teaching on hell and his kind of stirring up the pot in that area. So maybe if people are still uh, not sure how to approach that, maybe we can point them to your book here uh, on the blog, uh, on the blog post. Now, I want to mention another great resource, more straight apologetics here, and that's uh, the On Guard DVD curriculum. And this is sort of a companion uh, study resource for William Lane Craig's On Guard, Defending Your Faith with uh, Reason and Precision. Um, a really great book, but now we've got the supplemental DVDs. Can you talk a bit about them and the process you went through to uh, create this resource? Yeah, you bet. And I and I always hate to back up on uh, people who are interviewing me, but I, just to say, when I mention even the new atheists are more clear, please, uh, to the people who are listening, don't think that I'm saying that they've got a perfect understanding of God and judgment by any stretch of the matter. Uh, but to answer your question, Brian, I think uh, this was one of the highlights of my ministry, just having the privilege to spend a few days with Dr. Craig. Uh, I was actually with him uh, in Israel, uh, reasonable faith about to Israel, and I got to go with him, and we got to talking about putting together a DVD curriculum based on his book, On Guard. And so uh, the same group that helps put together my One Minute Apologist episodes uh, shot these videos, and it's eight videos where I interview Dr. Craig on the different chapters of his book. And it's designed in such a way for people in the local church to use it in small group settings or in Sunday school format. 
And we really wanted to be able just to help people to have a visual tool where I'm interviewing him uh, based on his book. And, you know, I've watched these videos and he's just brilliant and he's an amazing philosopher and apologist. And I think anything we can learn from him will be helpful. I do think that we got to make sure that uh, the people are really ready <laughs> to dig in because when you start with a book like that, even though uh, Dr. Craig would see that more of as a more of a beginning kind of book, I would see it being more of an intermediate book. I mean, it's a pretty sturdy uh, apologetics book for the beginner to say. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great one. You know, I remember reading Reasonable Faith a couple of times and then getting on guard and thinking. Ah, well, this makes it a lot clearer. But then I thought, well, there's still so much meat in here. And uh, we used it for a reasonable faith chapter, and we went through um, most of the ch- of the chapters in the book uh, for reasonable faith Belfast. And uh, yeah, it was it was tough going for a number of the people in the group. And I thought, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm just used to. <laughs> His stuff and and familiar with it, but it is you're right. It's more of an intermediate um, study. So I hope those the supplemental DVDs will just be at another layer of uh, understanding and probably depth. I imagine. But uh, now for small group study, it's it's a it's a good resource for that. But um, I want to point people to these on the blog. But um, if people want to get hold of these resources or other. Uh, materials by yourself, where would you like to point them, Bobby? Yeah, well, for my book, uh, they can go to Amazon. It's there. And for the DVDs uh, at our website, oneminuteapologist.com, that's where they can find those DVDs, and we can get those kits right out to them so that they can start using those. All right, well, we'll link to uh, both those resources online. Bobby, thanks again. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you today. Hey, Brian. It was a privilege speaking with you, and thank you for all the work you're doing in the apologetic world. I've been speaking to Bobby Conway, lead pastor of Life Fellowship in Charlotte, North Carolina, and founder of The One Minute Apologist. Links to Bobby's resources can be found at today's blog post at Apologetics 315. I want to take just a moment to thank you for listening to this podcast, and if you are a regular follower of Apologetics 315, I'd like to point you to our Facebook page. If you like Apologetics 315 on Facebook, you'll get just one update a day with a link to the day's blog post, and you'll be able to interact with those who are fans. If you follow on Twitter, you'll get tweets with some of the best links to apologetic resources throughout the week. I'd also like to ask for your support for Apologetics 315 as we grow as a ministry. We are a nonprofit organization, and our growth depends upon the regular donations of listeners like you. Our goal is to provide free, quality resources consistently in order to grow the next generation of Christian apologists. Would you help support the ministry? If so, you can click on the Support tab at Apologetics 315 for more information. If you'd like to listen to other podcasts by Apologetics 315, just search in iTunes for a variety of other resources. Would you like to hear a particular scholar or apologist interviewed? Contact me and let me know at interviews at apologetics315.com. This is Brian Auten, and thanks for listening.